Hey, good evening. Uh, it's six o'clock and we have a fairly long agenda, so uh, why don't we get started? Um, my name is Owen Foster and I'm the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Hamry from Oliver Wyman and his team have undertaken a nearly year long deep dive into Vermont's healthcare system to create a sustainable and affordable system responsive to Vermont's healthcare needs and demographic challenges. Uh, before we start, I did want to recognize some important contributors to this work and provide some context around why it's so critical for Vermont. Um, first, thank you, Board Member Jessica Holmes, for your work in pursuing Act 167 in 2022 and for your work on this project every day over the last year. In 2019, the Care Board recognized storm clouds on the horizon and pushed for hospital sustainability planning. And in 2022, legislative leaders passed Act 167 and Governor Sagat supported the bill and signed it into law. The legislature has been an incredible partner and I thank them for their dedication and input in this project. Uh, I'd also like to thank Susan Barrett and the Green Mountain Care Board staff members, Marissa Melamed, Hillary Watson and Daniel Bandler for their hard work every day to get the state to this point and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. And lastly, I'd like to thank AHS for their partnership on this project and leadership as they take the reins in leading the vital health care system reform transformation work that follows the release of Dr. Hamry's recommendations. Um, some brief logistics. Uh, the meeting is being recorded so people can go back and watch it later if they'd like. Uh, there will be closed captioning and you can access the captions in real time by clicking on the view closed captioning link under the meeting information on our main project page at the care board. And if you need help, um, you can just email uh, uh, me. My email is available on, on public on the website. Um, we'll also have public comment and take some questions at the end. We'll limit comments to about a minute so that everyone who wants to speak gets a chance. And we appreciate the media's attention and, and interest in this hearing. And if the media would like to ask Dr. Hamry any questions or the care board, uh, D Daniel Bandler from the care board sent a Teams link to the media. If you're from the media and would like that link, please email Daniel Bandler. Uh, his email is daniel.bandler at vermont.gov and he'll forward it to you. And you can also email Daniel or myself um, to set up any one by one interviews if you prefer. Um, so some context around this work and why it was undertaken. It was undertaken because our system has immense challenges in affordability, accessibility, and sustainability. For years, we've heard that healthcare in Vermont's unaffordable. Employers, patients, and families face skyrocketing healthcare prices and insurance premiums. In a nation with the worst healthcare costs in the world, Vermont has some of the highest healthcare costs in the country and is now one of the most expensive states to get healthcare. And the Care Board sees this every year when we have hospital rate requests and insurance rate requests. Vermonters feel it when their healthcare premiums go up 15 to 20% year after year. This year, uh, one individual plan on the QHPs seeks a 21% rate increase. In 2024, an unsubsidized silver plan cost a family of four around $33,000 with an additional $18,000, $19,000 in out-of-pocket expenses. The 21% increase would be over $7,000 more in premiums alone which is about the same cost as leasing a BMW. Those increases far exceed what we see nationally or regionally in other states and Vermonters just plainly can't afford it. And we see our exploding healthcare costs impacting property taxes and straining school budgets. Uh, during recent public comments to the board, Vermonters described their experiences with our high healthcare costs and what it does to them. And I encourage people to go and listen and hear from Vermonters that are dealing with these challenges. We heard stories of patients forgoing necessary care because they cannot afford it. People explained that their healthcare costs were greater than their housing costs. And Vermont, as we all know, is no longer an affordable housing state. And mental health practitioners who are critically important to serving Vermont's, one of Vermont's most pressing healthcare needs right now, described how they cannot afford healthcare insurance. So the people we're relying on to help us with one of the most important needs that we have for healthcare, and they can't afford health insurance. Those same folks also explained that their reimbursements are so low from Medicare, Medicaid, and even commercial, that some are ceasing to see insured patients and taking only cash. There's incredible inequity in that. Despite paying more and more for healthcare, we also hear that people have immense challenges in accessing healthcare. 
Many primary care practices are closed to new patients. In some areas of the state, people are waiting months to see needed specialists. This is just bad for population health. Uh, mental health care is worse, with some seeking mental health treatment after realizing they're in crisis, ending up spending weeks in our emergency rooms waiting for a more appropriate care setting. So we have incredible costs. We have difficulty accessing the care we need, and those in the industry are also struggling. Our local not-for-profit insurance companies are really uh, treading water at this point financially. Blue Cross Blue Shields reserves have dropped over 41% since 2015. Their razor-thin reserves put them at risk of being unable to pay claims, and they've suffered tens of millions of dollars in losses over the last several years. This last year, they've seen an unprecedented claim surge, which has dramatically eaten into margins and threatens insolvency. Meanwhile, our provider community has also shared their challenges with us. Some of Vermont's independent providers cannot afford to practice in Vermont, and our hospitals are not immune. In 2023, nine of 14 hospitals in Vermont were in the red with negative operating margins, which is especially troubling because the prior year, the Care Board approved hospital change in charge increases of over 10% in an effort to keep hospitals afloat. It did not work, and it will not work. From 2017 to 2023, hospitals' days cash on hand in Vermont dropped nearly 40%. Some hospitals experiencing decreases of nearly 50% in days cash on hand. Rural hospitals nationwide are losing money, and in response, they cut services and they are closing at an alarming rate, which thrusts communities they serve into a crisis. We do not want to see that chaos happen to any community in Vermont. To turn things around, we will need to be proactive and bold and change is hard. When it comes, you often see a cadence of events. People will discredit the messenger. They'll say they're wrong. They don't understand. Their data is no good. They'll point the finger, they'll blame somebody else, or they'll delay change. We will not and cannot do that here. We will not do that in Vermont. Well, the situation is difficult, it's an immense opportunity. If it weren't for this crisis, we would never have paused and looked at how our system functions. We would not have recognized the inequities. We would not have foreseen that the demographics and housing shortages were about to wallop us. Our healthcare system is currently designed is simply no match for our aging demographics, our immense workforce challenges, and our housing shortage. Our healthcare system is losing and will lose those battles. But we now have an opportunity to intentionally and thoughtfully design a system responsive to our needs. We have a set of recommendations from a world-class expert and we can create a system to allow for shared services and improve community health care access to local care, primary care, mental health, memory care, long-term care and rehabilitation, and health care at home. We can avoid chaotic losses and ensure durable health systems in local communities. And we can put our money where our mouth is and finally lead on supporting primary care. Some of these things are already happening. Hospitals are sharpening their pencils on their expense growth, working together to identify opportunities to share services and leveraging purchasing power. And to that, I applaud them and thank them. That is the right step to do, and they need to be recognized for that, and we need to support them. Um, Bruce Hamery is a physician, and he's a former chief medical officer of one of the country's most well-respected rural health systems and health systems design experts. He conducted Vermont's wait time study and more recently led the state's COVID modeling, which helped keep us all safe. He and his team have held over 100 stakeholder meetings and committee listening sessions and visited every community and hospital to assess our health system's ability to meet Vermonters' needs now and in 10 years as we dramatically age. His overview of our system and statewide recommendations will be presented tonight and a substantive detailed report will follow in the coming weeks with hospital and community specific recommendations. Before turning to Dr. Hamry, I'd like to turn it to Brendan Krause, the Director of Healthcare Reform from AHS. AHS has been a partner in this work and will be leading the challenging work of implementing transformation, and we need to support them. The Green Mountain Care Board is committed to that effort, and I thank them for their partnership in this. With that, I'll turn it to Mr. Krause. All right. Thank you, Owen. Um, really appreciate your partnership. I'd just like to say only a very few brief words so that we can get straight into the, the content, which is um, very informative and as Owen says, we're, permits um, 
pro provides a number of opportunities for the state. Um, I'd just like to say also thank you for all of you to all of you for coming. And echo uh, Owens, thanks to the legislature and um, of course to all of his team that's put together all of these. Um, now I think th this is probably tomorrow. I think is number thirteen of all of the meetings. So thank you for all of your work. Um, and uh, thank you also to um, Dr. Hamry and his team. And I'd just like to say one thing before handing it over to Dr. Hamry, which is, um, you know, the challenges are real, uh, but as Owen says, uh, the opportunities are there. And we're going to be beginning a, a, a process after after the conclusion of this first phase of work um, to collaborate both with the hospitals and with the Green Mountain Care Board and others um, to take some of the recommendations that have been made for the various hospitals and for the state wide uh, recommendations to analyze them in greater depth so we understand the impact in terms of cost and access that they would have in the individual communities and then begin to prioritize those um, those potential interventions and reforms um, and transitions so that uh, we can start to put together a plan um, in concert with the communities and with the hospitals um, in order to make some of those change needed changes to improve the stability and um, quality uh, and outcomes of the healthcare system so Thank you uh, for the opportunity to comment. And Dr. Henry, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Krause. <clears throat> Could we get uh, the slides up, please? Well, thank, I want to thank uh, Chair Foster and Director Krause for their uh, introductions and comments. Next slide. Vermont's health care is too expensive and its health care system is in disarray. It is not readily available to those in need and does not adequately address health inequities. Your legislature and two Vermont governmental agents, uh, units, the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Human Services, have worked together to develop and fund efforts to identify ways to meet these needs. This is a unique effort in the United States. Next slide. This novel approach has three major components. First, it takes a systemic view of all the components of healthcare delivery in the state, including nine independent community hospitals, five hospitals affiliated with academic medical centers, multiple state agencies, independent physicians, other healthcare professionals, and the multiple volunteer groups trying to address health and social needs. We have followed the citizen slash patient journey from home to hospital and back to identify needs at each point of care. This approach recognizes that although hospitals account for the largest share of healthcare spending, they do not control either the patients who come to them nor where those people go. Second, this process is designed to allow thoughtful redesign of the health ecosystem to prospectively address identifiable problems both now and in the future. This should avoid the need for a crisis response involving a more expensive and short-term solution after something happens. Third, and most importantly, the process gathers the lived experience of healthcare from hundreds of Vermonters to inform solutions. It has also identified many issues with current efforts to provide social services, meet the needs of those with the mental health and or substance use disorders, and the needs of other groups suffering from health inequity. As part of this effort, we also identified problems with the current arrangements for delivering healthcare to communities and individuals. This allows these needs to be solved in a systematic rather than a piecemeal way. Extensive involvement of community members and health professionals has allowed us to collect their experience of both success and failure in attempting to fix many of these identified problems. Next slide. The mandates of Act 167 are to conduct a data-driven, patient-focused, community-inclusive effort to assist Vermont's hospitals in reducing inefficiencies, lowering or constraining cost growth, improving population outcomes, 
reducing health inequities, and increasing access to essential health services. Our Oliver Wyman team is here to present and to answer your questions. My name is Bruce Hamery. I am a physician with over 50 years of experience in practicing and teaching medicine, in hospital and health system administration, and in healthcare consulting. My colleague in this effort is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland, a partner in the firm of West Monroe and an expert in health inequities. We have been ably assisted by Ms. Irene Way, our engagement manager, and by Ms. Melissa Kowalski, our senior consultant. As Chair Foster noted, my team and I began this journey to examine the healthcare system and hospitals in Vermont a year ago in August of 2023. In this effort, we have been greatly assisted by the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board, Ms. Marissa Melamed, Ms. Hilroy Watson, and many others. We have also been helped by many leaders and staff throughout the Agency of Human Services and by Mr. Mike Fisher and his staff at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Mr. Mike Del Trucco and his staff at the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems have been especially helpful. We have used many analytic approaches and prior reports to develop options for changes in care delivery and to quote, bend the cost curve in Vermont. Pertinent options have been presented to each hospital and its board. These options were then amended based on our conversations with each hospital leadership uh, and its board. Let me note that we have a short time tonight to present and to hear from you. I will not be able to discuss in detail our many findings and recommendations covering specific issues like primary care, mental health, chronic care facilities, and so forth. Some of these have been presented to the Green Mountain Care Board on June 19th and on July 9th of this year. They are available on the website of the Green Mountain Care Board and are accessible for your review and comment. Next slide. Sh shown here is the path we have followed on our journey. We are in the final phase with a report to the Green Mountain Care Board due in the fall. Um, this report will serve then as the basis for redesign efforts being led by the Agency of Human Services as Director Krause has noted. Next slide. We have spoken with and listened to over 2,800 Vermonters from all 14 hospital service areas across the state. The many people and groups we have interviewed are shown here. These have included not only hospital leaders and boards, but also the many healthcare professionals who serve our communities. These have included dentists, physical therapists, mental health counselors, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, EMTs, home health agencies, nursing home administrators, and many others. We have spoken with many state agencies and departments, as well as legislators. We've also met with over 100 community and state organizations advocating for those suffering from health inequity and those with special needs, whether those are mental health needs, physical needs, or those with specific illnesses needing more specialized care. We have sought out groups with unique language, ethnic, and gender identity characteristics. Next slide. So why are we here today? We want to accomplish four things. To report what you and other Vermonters have told us about your lived experience. To explain the problems facing your hospital, community, and the state as a whole. Most of these are beyond the control of the hospital. We will show you what some of these impacts might be on your community and on the Vermont health system writ large. We want to share at a high level what some options are that could be used to address the current and the future projected needs. This will, these will apply to most, but not all, communities. Fourth, and most importantly, we want to set the stage for your active participation as a citizen and as a community to, in the effort to transform healthcare in Vermont. 
As noted, this process will be led by the Agency of Human Services and supported by the Green Mountain Care Board. This is the next step in fulfilling the mandate of Act 167. Next slide. All Vermont communities are facing significant challenges to healthcare access, equity, and affordability. The access and equity challenges are shown on the left, the affordability challenges on the right. As noted, there are difficulties in getting timely appointments to doctors and for surgery. Trying to find a primary care physician can take over a year. Scheduling surgery for an eye operation can take more than six months. Long waits to be seen in the emergency room are common. Transportation is an issue, both for people needing to get the urgently needed care and those needing to get home from the emergency room or the hospital. Ambulance services in rural areas may be delayed and transports between hospitals take hours to arrange. Equitable access in healthcare services is an issue for many in Vermont because of their rural, lack, uh, rural location, lack of transportation, economic status, lack of housing or internet access. Others need more attention directed toward their individual language, ethnicity, religious tenets, mental health issues, or gender identity. The state and the hospitals have been addressing these issues, although more efforts are needed. On the affordability front, there have been major increases in both health insurance premiums, as Chair Foster has noted, and in out-of-pocket expenses, making the use of health care out of financial reach even for many with good insurance. Rises in both health care and housing expenses have outstripped increases in wages for the average Vermonter. Next slide. Vermont is facing a major challenge to provide affordable care to a rapidly aging population and one in which the number of working age people is declining. Changes in the total population and the age groups composing that population are shown here. These est estimates were done by Mathematica. These projections show the total state population decreasing slightly through 2040. However, the percent of people over 65 increases from 19.4% in 2020 to over 31% in 2040, reaching a total of 190,000 people. That constitutes over a 30% of the residents in the state. These people will have markedly different social and medical needs. These needs will include more assisted living facilities, memory care, and other facilities, as well as renovation in their homes to permit aging in place. The proportion of working age people will decline by 13%, reducing the number of people able to buy commercial insurance and therefore reducing the number of dollars available to pay for health care. Next slide. The place that a person gets their care has a major impact on the cost of that care. The least expensive places to receive care and to prevent the need for more advanced and expensive types and sites of care are shown at the top. Housing, houses, adequate numbers of facilities for group homes, mental health treatment, substance use disorder treatment, and so forth are needed. Enhanced capability and staff for primary caregivers, mental health and substance use disorder providers are also needed to improve access. As depicted, when these things are not readily available, people are forced to seek care in the emergency department, sometimes with an advanced form of illness needing hospitalization. If the illness is too far advanced, or if the community hospital is full, they may require transfer to a larger, larger distant medical center. The result is an inconvenience for the patient and her family, together with a bigger bill for the care. Next slide. 
As Chair Foster's noted, every commercially insured Vermonter's cost for health care has increased markedly over the past six years. On the left, are, but are shown between 2018 and 2022, the median increase in household income for Vermonters was 22%. In the middle panel, the Green Mountain Care Board approved hospital requested increases in revenue totaling 38%. In the panel on the right, the cost of a benchmark silver plan for a 40-year-old person increased 108% and is now twice as high as the comparable one in Massachusetts. A recent report from the Kaiser Family Foundation noted that Vermont's average cost for such a plan was the highest in the U.S. Next slide. Vermont hospitals and many others in the U.S. are facing significant operational and financial challenges. These include the inability to recruit staff, whether this is due to a national shortage of physicians, nurses, or other healthcare professionals, or to a lack of affordable housing in Vermont when they can be identified. I have heard many stories of a community recruiting a healthcare professional who came, worked for three months while living in a hotel, and then left after being unable to find an affordable home. This is an issue in other rural areas across the U.S. as well. Another major issue affecting small communities is the number of doctors in a specialty that must be recruited to provide an acceptable call schedule. A call schedule is the number of nights a week a doctor is responsible for coming to the emergency room or taking calls. The community must also have enough patients to support that many physicians. 40 years ago, an acceptable call schedule was one night in two. Now it is one night in every four or five. That means if you want one cardiologist, you need to uh, try to be able to recruit four or five and to have a community big enough to support that many. This presents recruiting difficulties across the U.S., not only for small hospitals, but also for larger ones, including the University of Vermont and Dartmouth. Many hospitals are old and need to replace air conditioning, heating units, elevators, and so forth. They have not been able to make the needed money from their patient revenues. Some surgeries done at hospitals are done too infrequently for the staff to maintain an adequate proficiency. Many of these require not only the expertise of a surgeon, but also from the anesthesiologist, the operating room staff, and often support from an ICU or certain specialists. Supporting these teams with the staff and equipment necessary will likely require hospitals to combine some surgical and medical specialists in ways that support regional access without requiring people to travel to the University or Dartmouth. Many hospital resources are also consumed by people who do not need the services of an acute care hospital. These individuals may be waiting for transfer to a mental health or chronic care facility. They may need a place to live or the services of a home health agency to be discharged from the hospital or from the emergency department. The hospital is not paid for these patients as their care is, quote, no longer medically necessary. They also occupy beds and nursing time that could be used for other patients who do require care in an acute hospital setting. On the financial side, the costs of the people who work in hospitals and the drugs and supplies needed to care for patients are increasing at rates higher than the hospital is paid. Capital reserves are being depleted and are yet unable to cover both expenses and future investments needed uh, for the hospital. There are also increasing uh, difficulties with insurers, making it more difficult for providers and hospitals to be paid by requiring pre-certification of testing, pre-authorization for procedures, or sometimes by denying payment altogether. Next slide. 
As Chair Foster noted, in fiscal year 2023, nine of the 14 hospitals in Vermont had negative operating margins. An operating margin is like the balance in your checkbook. It reflects the amount from patient services minus the expense of providing those services. If you include the two additional hospitals in the red in fiscal year 2022, 11 of the 14 hospitals in the state have recently had negative operating margins. This makes borrowing money expensive and difficult for the hospital and makes the financial sustainability of the hospital problematic. I must note, all hospital directors and staff are taking measures to address these issues. Next slide. This shows our projections for the finances of the 14 hospitals in Vermont, the operating margins through 2028. This makes certain assumptions which we have tested with many people. Not everyone agrees with these exact numbers. The assumptions we used for our projections were a cap on hospital price increases of 3.5% or a cap on revenue. This is the current cap for revenue increases set by the Green Mountain Care Board in its efforts to reduce and slow the rise in healthcare costs. Estimates of the ongoing increases in hospital expense nationally range from 5 to almost 8%. My estimate was 7% annual increase, and another consulting group has recently predicted an 8% increase for 2025. However, some hospital executives in Vermont told us they plan to control their cost increases to 5%, so that is the assumption we show here. We also did projections using a 7 to 8% increase in expense. Each of these projections was shared and discussed in a meeting with each hospital uh, leadership team and its board. All hospitals in Vermont showed these same trends toward sustained losses. Only one with these projections has a positive margin in 2028. Next slide. This slide shows the total dollars needed each year by all the hospitals in the state to either break even, that's the light pink bars, or to attain a 3% operating margin, that's the red bars. 3% would be the minimum needed to sustain capital improvements. The assumptions used on this slide are the, as shown before, a 3.5% cap on revenue and a 5% growth in expense. To break even, the hospitals would need $730 million uh, over the next five years, over that five-year period. To get to a 3% margin, they would need 3.4 billion, sorry, they would need uh, 1.4 billion uh, over the next five years. Next slide. This slide shows the other uh, estimate of uh, expense growth, which is uh, 7 to 8 percent, with the same cap of 3.5 percent on revenue. So these numbers are considerably worse. To attain a um, three, to, to uh, break even, the hospitals would need in aggregate $2.4 billion or roughly a little over a little under $4,000 per person increase dur over that time uh, to break even. To attain a 3% profit margin, they would need $3.1 billion. Clearly, neither of these um, uh, increase levels of increase uh, are acceptable. Next slide. This slide shows the increases in total hospital revenue approved by the Green Mountain Care Board over the last 10 years. The numbers at the bottom indicate that virtually 100% of all dollars requested were approved. Of course, not every 
the hospital had their increase approved every year. Note in the bars that uh, the total in billions in the small numbers above the bars goes from 2.1 billion in 2013 to 3.6 billion in 2014. These increases averaged 4.9% per year, but yielded roughly a 71% increase in total revenue. Next slide. The health, both health insurers in Vermont are not for profit and both are losing money. Shown are the underwriting losses over the last six years for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Note that in five of the six years, they lost money. These underwriting losses represent the amount of money they pay for your health care that exceeds the amount of money they, make, they take in from your insurance premiums. Their premium increases are driven by the cost of care paid to providers, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and others on your behalf. Insurers are tightly regulated by the Green Mountain Care Board to keep premiums affordable. They are also required to have reserves to ensure their ability to pay your bills. These reserves have reached alarmingly low levels. Next slide. Every hospital uses the following levers to improve their operating margins and financial health. They can increase rates and therefore payments from commercial insurers. The principal payers for most hospitals are Medicare and Medicaid. Together, these often account for 80% or more of total hospital revenue. Medicare payments are set by the federal government and only cover about 85% of a hospital's cost. Medicaid payments are set by the state legislature and the Agency of Human Services. These payments cover about 65% of costs. In Vermont, federal matching funds pay about 70% of total Medicaid dollars for the state. These are dispersed through the Department of Health Access of the Agency of Human Services. Commercial insurance payments make up the remaining 15 to 20% of hospital revenues and are used by hospitals to make up the difference between underpayments by government payers and their expenses. As discussed a moment ago, commercial insurance premiums are at maximal levels and the finances of the Vermont insurers are not in a good state. Therefore, this lever is no longer effective for hospitals or affordable for Vermonters. Hospitals can uh, reduce their operational expenses, which in many cases, small rural hospitals may not have the capability to do because they are already minimally staffed and staff is one of the major drivers of expense. Some of the larger hospitals serving Vermont do have the capacity to reduce their costs and therefore their charges for care. Hospitals around the U.S. can provide services at a cost equal to Medicare payments, and this must be a goal in Vermont as well. Hospitals can increase the volume of profitable services. They can provide uh, services such as implanting orthopedic joints or cardiology. Sometimes they must cut unprofitable services like pediatrics or obstetrics, or they can seek financial relief from the state or from grants or from donors. Pulling these levers for most Vermont hospitals has not been successful in achieving sustainable operating margins. Next slide. Hospitals cannot solve these problems alone. Different and innovative approaches are needed to reduce costs and to improve health services for the community. Solving Vermont's challenges in delivering health care requires concerted, sustained systems transformation, as will be led by the Agency of Human Services and supported by the Green Mountain Care Board. Next slide. So where do we go from here? What can the future of healthcare in Vermont look like? What will be required? What things are already underway that can be built upon or enhanced? Next slide. 
What does charting a path forward look like? First, recognize the current situation and the adverse headwinds you are facing. Second, change what you can and build on current efforts to change the way healthcare is delivered in your community. Next, design and implement ways to improve access, equity, and to reduce the cost of healthcare for your community. Done in the right way, these changes can ensure that the redesigned services have a stable financial and operational future. Abraham Lincoln said, the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. Next slide. Changes at both the hospital and state level are required to meet both current and future needs for healthcare. These needs fall broadly into the five areas shown. Provide housing for Vermonters and others moving into the state. Some in Vermont have no house. Others are living in houses without water, electricity, or heat. This is arguably the most urgent need Vermont has, not only to address inequity, but also to provide a safe place for people to receive appropriate care outside the hospital. Adequate housing, whether it is a single dwelling, mixed income housing, group housing for those with mental health or other needs, or assisted living facilities, is required to reduce the crowding in emer hospital emergency rooms and reduce the number of people staying in hospitals and mental health facilities because they have no, uh, nowhere else to go. In the planning process to be described shortly, hospitals and communities need to design a system in which there are regional referral centers, each containing an area having a sufficient population to support the physicians, staff, equipment, and other services needed to provide high quality, efficient care for specific diseases or conditions. Work we have done and shared with each hospital suggests that there is and will be sufficient need that some of these centers could be supported without people having to travel to the university, to Dartmouth, Albany, or Boston for care. Transportation for people to and from medical care, pharmacies, and other places needs to be enhanced and available in the late afternoons, evenings, and on weekends to help people with urgent care needs get to and from the doctor's office, the walk-in clinic, the urgent care, or the emergency department. Emergency medicine service, emer emergency medical services, which are largely staffed by volunteers, need to be combined, linked tightly to the hospitals, and made into a full-time workforce. This would create additional jobs in the community and allow the provision of patient transport to and between facilities using vehicles other than a mobile ICU. Embed updated and modern information technology in hospitals, offices, homes, and other places where people receive care. In the system to be developed, all providers, primary care, specialists, dentists, EMT services, hospitals, social care providers, and so forth, should have their payments linked to common goals, access, quality, efficiency, appropriate use of resources, and equity. Let me be clear about efficiency. This means doing the right thing at the right time, not forgetting to give a vaccine or ordering a more expensive test when another may be adequate and less expensive. As noted in the green below, the goal is to provide the most appropriate and needed care in your home, in the community, or close by. Next slide. There are many potential options for each hospital and community to work together and with other communities and hospitals to develop new programs and to expand existing ones. For people who lack a car or other transportation, taking care to them can serve, solve the problems of both access and equity. Examples exist of mobile dental treatment, 
mobile mammography units, mobile primary care clinics, mobile screening for osteoporosis, and others. Taking care to where migrant farm workers are employed makes it available without making them choose between getting care or losing wages. Expanded evening and weekend hours uh, for patient-centered medical homes, convenient care clinics, walk-in clinics, and urgent care makes care accessible to working people, school children, and others. Some groups in Vermont do this, but not all. Several have had to limit their hours because they lack the needed nursing staff. We've also discussed the need to develop regional referral centers. There are also opportunities to support these and to extend some of their services into other communities by jointly by hospitals jointly hiring physicians and nurses who could rotate clinics among towns either in person or electronically. Some hospitals are now sharing some non-patient services with others, and several are exploring additional opportunities to reduce and control costs. Additional options for sharing may be possible. We have discussed the need for an augmented EMS service. Establishing a statewide center to monitor which hospitals have beds or ED capacity in real time, and linking this to a statewide transfer center would cut the time needed to get a sick patient to the right place. The Department of Mental Health monitors the current capacity of all mental health beds in the state, and until recently, another agency did the same for acute care beds during the COVID pandemic. Hospitals currently use telehealth consultations to provide specialist support to the emergency department for stroke patients and the diagnosis and treatment for mental health conditions, heart problems, and others. These services often allow a patient to be kept in the local hospital rather than being sent elsewhere. Expanding this capability to allow people to be seen in their homes or treated in their home under monitoring for changes in their condition would enable high quality care to be delivered in a more comfortable and lower cost setting. As Vermont's efforts to improve the transmission of medical information and to expand broadband internet to more communities become successful, the ability to deliver more health services and support to people's homes to their primary care physicians and to further interconnect hospitals becomes easier. Another critical need is for programs to specifically address the needs of those people who have multiple medical and physical needs. These individuals usually comprise only 10 to 20% of the total population, but use 30 to 40% of the dollars spent on healthcare. One readily definable group are those people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid dollars to pay for their care. Nationally, this group consumes 30% of all Medicaid dollars and 34% of all Medicare dollars. There are over, one, uh, over 31,000 such individuals in Vermont representing 17% of the Medicaid population. There are programs available in Vermont and elsewhere to provide needed medical services and care to this high needs group. These programs significantly reduce the use of emergency care, reduce hospitalizations and therefore costs, and improve the health of these individuals. Next slide. As noted above, Vermont's future health system will be more regionalized than it is now. This will allow more mm -hmm. care to be done in communities. Awesome. It will, I'm excited for you to fish. Somebody should go on mute, please. It will allow more care to be done, uh, will allow specialized services appropriate to community needs to be available within a reasonable travel time from where people live. Uh, very importantly, it will help position these services.
so they can serve a population large enough to sustainably support the professionals, equipment, and facilities needed. The new system will also assist hospitals to repurpose inpatient units so they can provide other services for mental health, memory care, skilled nursing, or other needs. Examples of these, the kind of these regional centers are listed. The listed centers and others to be developed must be linked to regionalized EMS services staffed by full-time employees that can provide the necessary transportation to and from these facilities and between hospitals and other facilities. Placement of each center must be based on identified needs, not just of one community, but of several and containing enough population to be sustainable. Next slide. Statewide initiatives and policy changes will be needed to support and enhance these local efforts. These include improvements in transportation as we have discussed. This also improves equity. Creating appropriate housing for individuals and groups with common needs common needs is critically important, not only for equity, but also for getting people the right care at the right place. Lack of affordable housing is also a significant obstacle in recruiting people to Vermont. Efforts to train more healthcare workers are underway, but will still take time to produce the needed professionals. Current efforts must also focus on expanding the roles of existing professionals like pharmacists, EMTs, community health workers, and others. Simplifying and reducing administrative tasks will help both providers and patients by reducing the time spent in filling out forms and navigating through the complex web of social and medical services. This will free time for providers to see more patients and reduce their costs for staff to do paperwork. Realigning the resources in each community to improve efficiency and access will create opportunities to provide more services at a lower cost. I will now ask Ms. Sutherland to more specifically address our findings in the area of health inequity. Elizabeth. Thank you, Bruce. Can you guys hear me? And thank yes. you again. Great, thank you. And thank you again to all who have provided input to our assessment. As Act 167 states, and as you have heard from Chair Foster and Dr. Hamery, it was incredibly important that we obtained input from all Vermonters throughout this journey. In addition to the dozens of broad community meetings and provider meetings, we conducted targeted interviews with community members identifying as or representing Monters from Vermonters from LGBTQIA plus populations, BIPOC populations, immigrant and refugee populations, migrant farmer populations, older Vermonter populations, disabled populations, neurodivergent populations, veteran population, and incar incarcerated populations. Not surprising, but absolutely worth noting. These populations experience increased barriers to equitable healthcare access and outcomes. We summarized barriers experienced by these groups into three key areas. Gaps in culturally competent care, gaps in culturally competent and psychologically safe work environments, and lack of coordination with caregivers and broader community resources. The quotes on this slide provide specific examples of how these barriers were relayed during our community assessment. As healthcare leaders consider our recommendations at the state and hospital levels, it is critical they set goals that measure the impact to all Vermonters. To address gaps in culturally competent care, we underscore the great need to invest in a robust healthcare infrastructure, improve provider diversity, and increase and localize mental health services. To ensure the workforce is providing care in a culturally competent and psychologically safe environment, we highly recommend the implementation of programs to improve workplace culture while also addressing critical gaps in healthcare talent. Lastly, the state of Vermont and its healthcare providers must improve access to and coordination with other healthcare providers as well as community organizations. This requires both operational and technical investment. 
Dr. Hamry, I'll turn it back to you to take us through next steps. Thank you, Elizabeth. Here are the major steps in designing the future of your community and your hospital. The first step is to make the decision to change. I hope this presentation and our sharing of the information has convinced you of this need and its urgency. In this process, you and many others will choose among the many options, some of which we have presented, and will construct some of your own. These options will then need to be examined for their impact on the community and their financial stability and sustainability. Planning sessions and budgets to support the final options and plans will be made and the plans implemented. The Agency of Human Services with the support of the Green Mountain Care Board will lead the process to gather communities, providers, hospitals, and others desiring to plan their future and assist them in choosing among the options for new care, of care mechanisms. They will help evaluate the effect of those on the community health and for their sustainability, and then help to implement these transformations. Change will not happen by itself. Designing and implementing an improved sustainable a health delivery system for Vermont and Vermonters will require the active participation and engagement of everyone on this call, of other communities and hospitals, and of the state of Vermont. Broad changes in custom and practice will be required. What affects one community affects many other communities. An unplanned, unanticipated disaster in one community, whether a flood, a pandemic or a hospital closing has impacts across Vermont. Next slide. So where do each of you go next? How can you get involved in this process? You can attend community meetings and planning sessions. You can monitor the websites of the Green Mountain Care Board and the relevant units of the Agency of Human Services for updates and opportunities to comment. You can provide feedback on their plans and activities. You can support the administrators of your local hospital and its board in making what may be difficult or painful choices. Pardon. You can speak with your legislators and the appropriate state agencies to express the need for making the laws and funding needed to put your changes in place. Next slide. As I discussed a short time ago, the financial projections for many hospitals in the state show diminishing financial stability over the next three to five years. Therefore, your time horizon or runway to design and begin to implement the needed changes is short. The airplane runway on the left is two miles long, 10,000 feet. The runway on the right is on the top of a mountain in Bhutan and is 900 feet long with a cliff at one end and an airplane hangar at the other. Your runway is not 900 feet, it is longer but it is not 10,000 feet. My small town in Massachusetts debated for almost five years about bringing fiber optic cable to town. You do not have five years. Next slide. Our team's work in this presentation are only the first steps in the complicated process for improving healthcare delivery systems in Vermont so they are sustainable, affordable for all, can imp improved have improved equity, improved access, and improve the health of all Vermonters. I hope I have convinced you of the urgency of the need to address these problems, the need to be proactive, and to support the process and changes needed to achieve the goals outlined by your legislature. Next slide. Please remember these three lessons from our work. Vermont's health system is failing and needs urgent fixes. You experience this daily. There is no single or simple policy solution to these changes, to these problems. 
Success will require major and dramatic changes in both the way Vermonters receive health care and in the way it is paid for. With the state spending over $6.4 billion for health care, there are sufficient funds for designing and implementing an affordable, sustainable health care system capable of providing accessible, equitable, and high quality health care. Thank you for your attention. I will now turn this back to Chair Foster. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Bruce. Um, we have time for uh, public comment and uh, we can take some questions if folks have any. There's a raise your hand function and I'll try and call on people in the order with which they raise their hands. Um, Barbara Black. Um, Barbara Black, you can go ahead if you have a comment. Um, I think you're you're muted if you hit the. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, you were asking us to believe that the people that got us here are going to lead us out of this mess. And I just, they are so locked into a form of governance within a hospital system. I know because I have been fighting them for years. Um, and it is just like, it is so hard to get people to want to try new things want to have the courage to go against the tide, want to speak truth to power without being fearful of being uh, let go from their position. These are the things that I deal with on a, on a daily basis, and I am in that hospital almost every day trying to make it better. I am 86 years old. I would like to see something changed before I die. And my fear is that it's not going to, and I will probably end up without the care that I need for the rest of my life. I, I just want to beg people that are in power to start thinking outside of the box. The same old, same old, is not going to work. Listen to your patients. They have tried to give you the answers for the 25 years that I have been involved in it. And you have turned a deaf ear. You have thrown me out of meetings. And I am sure you have done this to others. You consider me a rabble rouser. I am not. I just, I'm on your side. And there are so many like me. And we just want to make it better and sustainable. Thank, thank you for your comment. There's a the first thing to do is make sure we all have the right facts and we all understand. I, I think your point is well taken that people have been trying to change this and fix this for 20 years in this state, and it hasn't gotten better in the last five that I can tell or the last 10. I haven't been here all that long, but what I observe is that the situation is so dire, there is no choice other than to change. And it's imperative that we do. So that's why the state has gone and, and worked with Dr. Hambry and his team to try and drive that change now. And it will be people like you that speak passionately and truthfully about your experiences that will help drive and support this change. Thanks, Mom. Um, Molly Fleming. Okay. Um, our very capable auditor for Vermont recently had a, a post about reference payments that there's such a discrepancy from one hospital to the other for costs. And I wondered if this has been considered. I didn't see it mentioned in any of these slides. And I think it's uh, there's a few states that have saved millions. And I'd like to hear what the group says about that. 
my second comment, just I would say is, I'm a naturopathic physician. Many naturopaths are primary care. As far as I know, none of us were consulted about this situation, this process. So, uh, and I've like this previous person have many, many been part of many different healthcare reform things over the 30 years I've practiced in Vermont. So anyway, I'm just saying uh, this is there is a limited view of who are providers for one thing. And two, um, the, mostly I want to know what you're thinking about this reference payment thing. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just comment. We have uh, talked with naturopaths and others in our community meetings with the uh, the provider community. That's included. Uh, we, we extended a general invitation. So I have talked with some of your colleagues. Owen, I, do you want to you okay, know what? Thank you. I, I have. I can say something, um, and then I'll turn it back to you on the the question about whether you considered reference based pricing. Um, what I would say is that the care board and its hospital regulatory function does look at how um, the commercial costs are for particular hospitals. That is in our guidance. It's something we compare different hospitals to nationally to peers, um, and it's something that we consider in making the hospital budget decisions. Um, a strict reference-based pricing program takes considerable time to implement, and that has not yet been implemented, but it is something that certainly a number of board members and staff are very interested in. Um, one thing I would say about that is it's not so easy as, you know, simply go to 250% of Medicare. Our system, we have a hearing tomorrow actually on this topic, and I hope people can attend if they have time. Um, we're quite a bit higher than that in Vermont, and we're increasing. But if you just immediately drop down to 250, it does cause real risk of serious instability across hospitals in Vermont. So you'd want to make sure that you do it thoughtfully, as opposed to um, what could end up happening is cutting of really important services in response to that kind of immediate dramatic cut. So what I would say is the board does consider it in the context of making our budget decisions, but we have not yet implemented a reference-based pricing program. And I'll turn it to Dr. Hamry. Uh, just well, no, it is something we've we've considered uh, as well. I think Chair Foster's pointed out the implementation issues. The other thing I just note is that uh, the state is in some discussion with the federal government about uh, some alternate payment methods. And so, as you'll see, the, as you've seen, our estimates only go out to 2028 because nobody really knows what the payment systems might look like after that. But thank you for the question. Um, I think, uh, Ms. Bisbee, Mary Alice, how are you? Um, Mary Alice, I think you're muted. Um, would someone be able to unmute Ms. Bisbee? Chair Foster, Microsoft Teams does not allow us to unmute other participants. They have to do that on their end. Oh. Do we know Sorry. how to, can we help people and tell them how to do it? I don't know how myself. Mary Alice, if you look to the stop, the top of the screen, there should be a microphone icon. It might have a slash through it showing that you're on mute. If you click that microphone, it will bring you off mute. Is it at the top of your screen? Mary Alice may have an iPad. Is it the same thing on iPads? Why don't we come back um, and maybe we can try helping her um, and try and come back. So Mary Alice, we'll try and come back to you. Um, I think next was uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hunt. Good evening and thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'd like to um, speak as a, one of the physician owners of an independent primary care practice and also a patient and 
family member of multiple patients. Um, I feel that Vermont has an economy of scale and that's what brought Act 48 to come in 2011 to realize we have to recognize and solve many of our own problems here in our small state with our fixed population. Ideally with the um, details Dr. Hamry mentioned, like good housing and childcare in place. And one of the biggest threats I see right now, and one of the reasons why I supported H-766 is managing a practice and paying for health insurance for our employees. And this has become very problematic. During the pandemic, we worked without knowing we were gonna get paid, without knowing how to pay our people. We did the work and patients and providers were the real champions um, of the healthcare system in Vermont far beyond and far more visible than the Green Mountain Care Board. The all-payer model kind of, you know, left everyone's uh, forefront. And um, the payers and One Care Vermont were able to buoy certain care delivery through some fixed PMPM payments, as well as um, forgiveness for prior authorizations. And now that the state of emergency has you know, elapsed, we have our own state of emergency like Dr. Hamry and Elizabeth put forth. And so I have concerns about not raising our prices um, beyond an unreasonable amount. I mean, if you read the, the doctrine that was written to create the board, I think they started with 4.8% as a healthy annual rate increase. The payers are being allowed to increase 19% a year. I mean, 13%, 11%, when the costs are not going up at that rate in the primary care sphere, we're pretty, you know, common sense folks, we're making it work for people. And we're always really open to innovation and population health. And I have concerns that the heavy aggressive regulation of the board over the years without enough innovation with our economy of scale has created this problem. And we just see, um, clinical staff ping pong from hospitals to the independent primary care sphere, back and forth, back and forth, because they need good benefits or at least decent benefits. And we are now paying people's premiums for family plans because they are so egregiously expensive. A fee for service model would probably be cheaper. And so much of the cost, this is why I bring up Act 766, comes from paperwork, which the payers publicly um, cried foul about saying that costs are going to go way, way, way up. But so many of the costs that they're already paying that drive up these 19% per year premium increases are, you know, 10 pieces of paper a week to my attention for some small clinical detail that is already happening that they don't need to harass me about over and over and take my time away from patients. So I'd like to learn more about payer premium yearly increases. And I want to make sure everybody knows what a risk that places to the existing healthcare workforce in Vermont. Thank you. Um, thank you for the comment. One, one point is um, I would say that the costs are going up that much for the insurers. They're, if they weren't, we would not be approving a 10 or 20 or 15% rate increase. Um, in our decisions, which we can send out, if you go through them, we'll actually talk about what the drivers are and um, their costs are going up that much. And that's why they're actually suffering pretty serious losses at the insurance companies, despite um, 15, 20% rate increases. It's, it's the cost of claims. And that's why the RBC has dropped, the reserves have dropped 40% in the last nine years. Um, so the cost of healthcare is really, really high in Vermont, both the prices. And I think you know, one point for independence and primary care, I think that's a really important area where we got to make sure that the more affordable, accessible quality care is financially supported. And as you know, the board doesn't set rates for independence. We set rates for hospitals. And so one thing the board has done is taken a lot of steps to make sure that there's better equity between the hospital system rate increases and the non-hospital system rate increases, recognizing the really important backbone to our system that that is. Um, so I think this last year we did see 
Um, I actually think last year, the non-hospital system got rate increases that were higher than the hospital system for the first time that, that I'm aware of. So that should be balancing out um, in a way that sustains the whole system. Um, thank you for your comment. Um, uh, I'll go to uh, Sally McKenzie, and then I'll try going back to Mary Alice. Uh, Sally? Thanks, Owen. Um, again, I've kind of been in the profession of tracking health care costs in the state of Vermont. A couple of comments you indicated, um, or kind of uh, Dr. Harmony did, about administrative expenses being scrutinized at the hospital level. Does that include executive salaries? Kind of one comment there. And the second comment is the state of Vermont is one of the states that has many, many mandates. And it's our legislature that passes these mandates without recognizing the impact to the cost. You just made a comment regarding cost of claims being the reason rationale for the insurers to increase their rates. But do we ever see conversations happening around the state being such a heavily mandated state? for fully insured plans having to cover certain things? Yeah, good good question. So on the first one, um, in terms of administrative costs at the hospital system, that is pretty front and center in our hospital budget review process. Last year for fiscal year 24, um, a number of decisions cited um, the administrative costs of particular hospitals in support of the decisions that the care board made. Um, so hospitals had submitted requests last year, and in looking at it, one of the factors that played um, an important role were the administrative costs. In terms of executive salary specifically, that was not part of last year's um, decisions. It is in the statute that the care board is authorized to review executive compensation. And we have in other contexts, in connection with the uh, accountable care organization, the board did reduce executive compensation. Um, which was appealed and um, the Supreme Court upheld and recognized the Green Mountain Care Board's authority to uh, to do that. Um, so it is in the statute. Administrative costs certainly are part of our purview and something we look at, and it's in guidance again this year. So that is, that is an important piece. Um, and then in terms of the legislative mandates, um, I don't know that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of various pieces of legislation. I can only say that in my experience working with the legislature on healthcare issues, which is only two sessions deep, um, there's a lot of questions and process that went into trying to understand as best they could the implications of the um, full spectrum of the implications of the decisions and the bills that they were proposing. Um, that might be a better question for, for legislative leadership, but that was my experience anyway. Yeah, I would add certainly administrative costs, not only in terms of people, but also amount of paperwork and all that is something that uh, uh, that we are trying to address and, and we'll have recommendations about. Thank you for raising that. Thank um, you. Thank, thank you, Sally. Uh, Mary Alice? Yes, I think I unmuted myself. Yeah, you, you. you sound <laughs> and, good. And, and um, I'm 87. I'm a year older than Miss Black, so I have a lot of uh, history in doing dealing with healthcare in Vermont. Uh, and I haven't heard the word single payer being used. Universal health care. There are hundreds and thousands of um, Vermonters and people all across this country that are working for that big change. And we, what we have now is corporatization, corporatization of health care. And we need to get rid of corporatization. One, one person running their own office is one thing, but people are corporatizing how they do their paperwork, all this stuff. And the administrative costs are just outstanding and r ridiculous. And that's what you really need to get rid of. And I want to thank you, Owen, for getting things done, because uh, I think that the uh, Green Mountain Care Board is finally starting to get things done. And I hope you'll continue with this. 
you've found out what the problems are, but so many of us know that we need, really need single payer health care and and the uh, Senate now has a bill and they haven't had one in a long time. State-based universal health care was introduced by Markey of Massachusetts. And that's what we really need. And maybe the, all the hospitals could be run by the state instead of having it all, all of them run separately and certainly get rid of one care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comment. Um, and for your years of help and guidance in the healthcare universe here in Vermont. Um, Ashley, Ashley Millet or Millet? Thank you. Um, so I don't know if this is one of the things that you may not be able to um, answer today, but I'm a mother of a daughter who has a rare genetic disorder and she's two. And we've been working through the diagnosis, diagnosis process and setting up her care for now and the future. Um, her care requires weekly infusions um, until for the rest of her life or until there is another treatment or cure. Um, and we do these infusions right now at UVM in Burlington. Uh, we live in uh, Washington County in Barrie. Uh, so we go down there weekly for these infusions, and a year ago we requested home infusions um, for many different reasons, and our county doesn't have pediatric infusion um, uh, program or staff, or I, I'm not sure what why they don't have it. Um, and UVM had said that they were working on um, a program that would be able to reach patients for home infusions outside of Chittenden County um, and to be able to help more individuals than just my daughter. Um, and from my understanding is that the proposal has been completed by the hospital and has been submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board. And I didn't know if this was one of the solutions that may be being considered for inclusional access um, or if there um, is solutions for like this kind of rareness. I mean, it, it, there's no other infants with this right now. So that's just my question. Dr. Henry, I'll let you take that one. Well, thank you. No, it's exactly the sort of thing we're talking about, right? It's the kind of thing that, that needs to happen. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your daughter. I'm glad there's a treatment. Uh, I, I would just comment, and I don't know and don't need to know about the specifics, but I would just comment there are a lot of these infusion treatments that are coming along for a variety of diseases. Uh, many of them have different requirements. And so one of the thoughts about trying to do regionalized centers uh, has to do just with that issue that you need people who are appropriately trained. But certainly if an infusion can be given in the home, then that's the best place to do it. If it can be done safely with monitoring and so forth, it's the best place to do it. So uh, I'm delighted the universities developed that and uh, we'd like to see that done elsewhere around the state too. Thank you, and um, I apologize, Catherine. I think I I think I skipped you by by mistake. Um, so, Catherine, please go ahead. Um, Catherine. Sometimes the mic is on the top of the screen, not on the bottom. Um, all right, we'll give you a, a minute, Catherine. Um, the, the mic button is, if you look in the top right-hand corner, there's a little red box that says leave and then share and then mic. Uh, so if you go up there, uh, that might help. Um, but I'll turn back to Ms. Fleming first and give you a second. And Ms. Fleming, you asked about reference-based pricing and, and I gave an incomplete answer um, because the legislature 
also appropriated $15,000 to the CARE Board this last legislative, legislative right. session. Um, and we have some financing to investigate and start studying reference-based pricing, which would be an important step to implement. So I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, go ahead, Molly. This is just a quick response to uh, Ashley's comment. I had a patient who gets um, infusions for severe, severe migraines. And if she goes to the neurologist office, Medicaid pays for it. If she gets it at home, which would be much easier, it doesn't pay for it. And so it would be wonderful to have a place where you could report these kind of really inefficiencies, just like a, you know, like in Burlington, they have a phone app where you can say where somebody needs to fix the road. You know, you could have a, like a little app or something where people could just say, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it's just a comment related to Ashley's thing. Thank, no, thank you for making that. And that's one of the reasons we keep having these sessions. Uh, right now, this is the mechanism, but you've you've raised a good a good point. Thank you. Um, Kim Fitzgerald, how are you? Go ahead. Good. How are you? Um, good. Thank you for the public comment tonight, and thank you for the presentation. I have made comments. I have seen this now. This is my second time. So I um, just wanted to, it's more of a comment really than a question. As I know, Bruce, you mentioned uh, expanding on the items that are working, uh, but didn't go too far into that. And so I just want to call out again that I really like to hear more building upon what is working. Um, you know, within this presentation, and I know the slide itself said pace, and I just want to call out, you know, Vermont did have pace and it didn't work out. So I'd really like to highlight the things that are working, like the Blueprint for Health and, and SASH, and the fact that we are a population health model proven to save, you know, Medicare dollars and um, have been capped for many, many years and really need to expand. We're serving um, the older population, but we now have a pilot serving families and would love to be ex able to expand that across the state. Um, and we are using, you know, hub-based um, model within affordable housing. So we're already using that regional uh, design you mentioned. So I know I've said similar comments before of just, um, you know, many of these suggestions you have are stuff I feel like we already are working on. It really just does need to be expanded. Yes, and, and I agree with that. They they certainly need to be expanded uh, uh, and, and have been successful. And I do, I continue to apologize because we only have a short time to present, but thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Kim. Um, Michelle Wade. Good evening. Most of you on the board have heard from me previously, but I want to throw out another item and sort of expand on Ms. Fitzgerald's comments, um, speaking on behalf of members of the Vermont Nurse Practitioners Association and other probably primary care providers who please feel free to chime in. We talk about ways to keep the population healthy and to save money. And I know that when I work in my primary care role, I get very irritated by some of the Medicare Advantage groups that are out there calling my office or sending messages to my office stating a patient needs certain primary preventative care when I've already documented that we've done it one way or another or that the patient has chosen in shared decision-making not to do this. And yet it's then tying up my staff time and it's tying up my time to re-answer these same questions. So if we're gonna have someone out in the community doing this and we're gonna partner with them, then we either all need to be on the same EHR, which will never happen, we've already proven that, or unless we go to the BA, or we need to, you know, stop wasting this money. Let's be real. So this occurred again this week. So I really am hot on this topic and would love to hear from other PCPs how they deal with it. Thank you for your comment. Um, I'll go to Ms. Hunt because it might be in response to the last comment and I'll come back to Barbara Black. Dr. Hunt. Sorry. So that was helpful, Michelle and Barbara. I do find that the 
need for bilateral communication could be a lot better for those of us in the field, because we all know it's much cheaper to promote, sustain, and maintain health in our state. And we do it, and it doesn't have to cost that much. We're really busy. And so when we see roadblocks, um, which often come from payers who are spending a lot of money on advertising and changing their formulary every year, despite the evidence base that does not support that, or hiring sub smaller companies that are for-profit entities to manage pharmacy costs, advertising, and informing the primary care community and patients of I don't know. I mean, they're, 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 these are not scientific, cost-effective measures. They're extremely corporate, and they kind of pull the wool over people's eyes, and they really undermine the trust in people like me and Michelle, which is one of the harder things. Um, so, I have tried. So, we had with we've had withheld pay, pay, payments from BCBS like in chunks, you know, for quarters, and just let it float and waited and. You know, we can do that, but when like you can't get medication for your patients and the legislatures, you know, the asthma controller medication issue, and you're getting papers in your mailbox that tell you you're not doing the right thing for your patients because the meds aren't available and you have to process those when you're supposed to be seeing patients and you try to reach the medical director or someone in the medical director's office to just say, hey, like, I'll, I'll buy you dinner or let's have an email. I'd love to tell you what it's like in the field. You get so shut down as a PCP and it, it's just demoralizing. I, I feel like the primary care advisory board, which many of my friends and colleagues are on, is a great way to have working providers in the state provide their hands-on vignettes like this. Um, these, these four are terrific. I just don't trust the payers, Owen. I don't think they need to charge as much as they're charging. They're not showing us, they're not trusting that we know what we're doing as medical professionals and respecting us with the nitty gritty of what needs to happen. They are saying, I want to save a few dollars. So every year I'm going to change what PPI I pay for and when I'm going to pay for it, or I'm not going to pay for it for all, but I'm not going to tell you that. And you're not able to keep track of all the payers and what they want. So you're following the evidence base, which is how we doctors practice, but it bites you in the butt every time because it takes so much time and patients are waiting at the pharmacy for their medication that you told them would help them and they can't get it. And so when things like that happen, I try to keep track. I try to respectfully be calm and take note and think about the systems and think about who really needs to champion these things. And I always come back to it being patients and the providers and really needing to streamline and identify which administrative bodies of power in Vermont really should be um, taking on this makeover here. And I, I haven't come up with a great answer. But the payers really need to earn our trust back because we've gotten so far from the all payer model. I mean, it's a joke. So we'll just jump I, in. Go, go ahead, Brendan. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Brendan Krauss with the Agency of Human Services. I've recently started as director of healthcare reform. And I just wanted to take a step back and say uh, thank you, Michelle, for the comment because I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk to you offline about it. Um, we are going to, you know, this is a very important part of our, our work, This the, the, the work that Owen Foster and team have led with uh, Dr. Hamry. But it's just one part of healthcare reform. And we're going to be taking a, a comprehensive look um, at the other um, tools that we have and the other programs that we have because I know we have a number of community based programs that are interfacing with primary care, but they're they're not always as joined up as, as we might want them to be. Um, and so we're going to start taking a look at that. That may be, well be a place where we could start to take on uh, some of those kind of more, um, the, the, those nuances that you know about that we don't. Dr. Hunt, I had a question too. Um, so the care board has a kind of a limited purview into insurers because we only regulate the rates really um, for the QHP plans. Is your experience across the board with payers or particularized to some or different types of plans? I do understand that you don't right have everyone yeah. in your hands, right? No, I'm just saying I don't I don't and, I'm not we that deal familiar with, with yeah. commercial payers. Um it's well, as an employer, it's with some 
payers like that we're trying to work with to provide health insurance for our staff. So that's been one thing, but with um, MVP, BCBS, Vermont, and then the, you know, that we deal with, I know we deal with Cigna, some cover breast pumps, some don't cover breast pumps, you know, it's, it's just having to keep track of all those nuances and, and reading the headlines of the double digit increases when so much of the, I mean, I mean, I really believe that 766 might help a little bit. And I just want to be able to have the conversation continue. And if the Green Mountain Care Board is able to harness this energy and create um, accessible, high quality Vermont based healthcare that is affordable in real time, that will help both areas of interest, the employer area, um, zone, and then also the having the needs of patients met without having to, I don't know, sometimes just have to sign up for these plans that don't really meet their needs. And it's just, it's hard to see that happen to them. And then you try to explain that, that you're not the problem. That's a, I think a really good point. Um, uh, Barbara Black. Ms. Black. Try to come back to you. Um, Margaret Godone or Gadden. Hi, thanks for uh, thanks for having us all tonight, and I really appreciate very much these forums. Um, I'm sorry that my camera doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, I'm a retired uh, internist and public health physician. And uh, most recently, I've been working um, on the uh, community with uh, the community nurse situation in the Upper Valley. And um, I know you've heard from uh, um, us in the past, excuse me, just one second, uh, particularly at the meeting at Windsor. But I just wanted to reiterate, because it wasn't physicians who spoke, um, as a physician, a, um, one of the most frustrating things that I found was not being able to have access to what was going on in someone's home and environment. So while I could prescribe something, I saw a diabetic for maybe 15 minutes, four times a year, and yet they live with their diabetes at home all the time. But I didn't really know what they were doing and how they were able to control their diabetes. So I think that one of the most important things that community nurses or community health workers in that role, or what I would call a community health extender can do is to continue the work of managing somebody directly in their community by overcoming the barriers, the social barriers uh, to adequate management. And I understand that CMS now pays physicians to ask about social barriers, but if they don't have a means of addressing them, it's not really helpful other than to document it. So I think something that Vermont really needs is to have a network of community healthcare coordinators, nurses, whatever you want to call them, that are in a non-clinical role, who are the end point, the eyes on the ground, who can uh, do chronic care management, help physicians uh, be more efficient, probably improve their quality, and most importantly, keep patients out of hospitals and reduce 30-day rehospitalizations, reduce ER visits. I know Blueprint does this, but Blueprint doesn't do home visits, and they don't reach all patients. They're really focused on the FQHCs, which is terrific. We are so lucky to have Blueprint in this state, but we need it to be expanded, and we need to be able to have it connected to little towns where the people working in, in towns who know the local community resources, including just individuals who can provide those. So in closing, I'd just like to stress how incredibly important and enriching it would be 
and cost saving in this state uh, to have a network of these community workers extending the health care system. Thank you. Well, Nathan, this is Brendan Krauss again from AHS, and I couldn't agree more. And um, one of the things, this is part of the sort of refresh we're going to be doing with health reform, is to look at those different programs. So Blueprint, then there's the Vermont, Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, then the Field Serv and Field Services. Sorry, I sort of blathered that all at once. Um, to look at how we might start pulling some of those resources together in a more comprehensive way, and understanding sort of what the right. Um, I don't know if structure is the right word, but what the right uh, model is for the individual community. So thank you for the comment and it'd be great to have any thoughts you have in your in your written comments, if you have any. No, and, and I, thank just thank, thank you again. I mean, uh, you're right on. I, I would say, given the shortage of nurses, one of the things we've been uh, th thinking about and, and other people do is to use uh, EMTs with some additional training to do some of that. And I, I would just point out uh, another one of the recommendations, the EMTs, when they do a, a call, record the situation in the home. Is it safe? Do you have a refrigerator? That kind of stuff. That's in a database that apparently nobody has access to. So there's additional information that would probably help you in managing a patient that might be available. And I know it's something that uh, Mr. Kraus and his group will, will be looking at. Thank you for the comments. Um, Catherine Williams. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm an RN case manager. I work in an emergency room. I'm also a new graduate in healthcare policy, and I'm very, very eager to get involved in um, fixing uh, the healthcare issues in Vermont. I need to speak to the commercial payer problem. In my ER, when I try to get a minor to a mental health care facility, Blue Cross Blue Shield requires a 48 hour prior authorization. So that little teenager is in the ER waiting to get to a good place to go. And the ambulance companies are saying, we're not gonna transport this person until we have prior authorization, which A, can't happen on the weekend. This is criminal in my mind. This is more harm to that child. And it is even harmful to adults but even more so for, for children. I also want to advocate for um, nurse faculty. We need to have educators out there. We need more nurses. And Vermont cannot fix this problem unless we get more people in here. There are not even a million people in Vermont. And most of us are over 65, right? So um, I'm eager to be part of the solution, but I'm not seeing many solutions presented tonight. I'm, I, I think we've identified and labeled the problems, but I'm not seeing what the solutions are. And um, thank you, Mary Alice, for the clap, because um, I think we should still be looking for a single payer system. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I would comment, we have things to address those issues that you've mentioned. Like like I said, you, we've got a short time to talk and we could spend a couple of days with you, but thank you for raising those. Um, and, and Dr. Hammer, your report will include a more thorough discussion of these, I, I believe, right? You're going to get about um, 150 suggestions plus with a fairly detailed recommendation. So yes, sir. Um, Barbara Black, want to try your mic? Yeah. Uh I apologize. Teams thinks that I work for the network, and so it keeps asking me for my identification number, uh, which is why I black in and out. Um, my question is about administrative red tape in order to get anything done. Uh, we were, the, the medical center was told by the Joint Commission because of a number of different things to uh, find a safe permanent place for adult infusions. And um, the design team was eventually headed up by the people that actually did the work, the nurses that were part of the infusion 
Uh, but it took a long time for us to get to that point because prior to that, it was only administrators that sat in the room that were defining what all of these people that did the work were going to do and how they were going to do it. And they had never really set eyes on what the unit was. And our biggest problem, because they said it would take anywhere from three to five years to get it up and running, and even at that minimally, um, we got it up and running in in one year. And that is because they found a way to bypass all of the administrative red tape. In other words, the number of people that have to sign off on it in order to get anything done. And I am sure that it is more of a problem throughout the network um, just in trying to accomplish something in a short period of time. And I wonder if there's any way to deal with something like that. Uh, I know it was mentioned about administrative salaries. I think that there's just, in in respect to the number of client uh, clinical people that we have, there's just too many layers of administration that we have to go through in order to get anything done. Thank you. Yeah, it it certainly sounds like that. I uh, would comment in a prior life, I ran a couple of hospitals, including one university hospital, and my job was to simplify things. So. Uh, you know, I, I think that's probably a little too detailed for us to get into at this level, but I'm glad you're able to get the problem fixed. Um, Amy Martone. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Amy Martone. I am the executive director for the American Nurses Association of Vermont. Um, I am here tonight with more than half of my board members um, in response to some outcry from nurses across the state who've been participating in these hearings in their communities. And we will be providing um, a written statement as part of public comment along with our contact information. Would love to know more about how the nursing voice was present in this. Um, I think we have a lot of talent and experience and education that could really help contribute to driving these solutions, especially when we're looking at things like access to care, workforce development. Um, so I would I would love to um, open up the door for collaboration for us to work together um, as a representative of the nursing voice of over 15,000 registered nurses who practice here in our great state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you'll send us your contact information, we'll be glad to get in touch with you. I'd love to have a conversation. Thank you. And I'm familiar with our outreach. I'm, I, I know that there was extensive outreach to, to nurses because it is such an important piece of this work um, and such a driving uh, issue here that we have with 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 staffing. Um, so we'll definitely get in touch with you too, uh, Ms. Martone, and thanks for commenting. Um, Representative Mosland. Um, hi there. Thanks for letting me on. Um, this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I wonder if the people here let me back up just a little bit. There's a lot of solutions or partial solutions that have been offered this evening. Um, some of them connected and some of them not very well connected, unfortunately, and they would be much better. We would all be better served if the connections were stronger. And I wonder if the participants here are familiar with a process called the crosswalk, which I did a number of times for the Department of Labor, which is to get a bunch of suspects in the room and ask around, you know, on flip charts, what are the what are the solutions, what are the pieces of a solution that we would need to solve this problem? And then the next exercise is, of all the people we have on the flip chart, what does each one have to offer? And by crosswalking, for lack of a better term, back and forth on um, deliberative process through the day, it's possible to begin to design a system of how um, needs and wants get connected with the people that can do that sort of stuff. And I would highly recommend that a that um, the, the principal participants here conduct a crosswalk. It doesn't have to be really formal. It doesn't have to include everybody, because of course this is an ongoing process. But it may very well be that the result of it at the end of the day, 
would be a series of, geez, what if we connect it to this and that, and these people can do it. Um, and from that, we may get recommendations for the Green Mountain Care Board, or of all things, um, recommendations for the legislature, for Pete's sake. And we've got several months to get organized here. Um, and I suggest that it would be very fulfilling if we could do such a thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, Representative. And, and you, when you're speaking, I was thinking this. We, we, I feel like we have crosswalked in a way. My experience feels very much like a crosswalk in going to a lot of these meetings and speaking with a lot of various voices. Um, but your your point is well made that we need to get together with decision makers and move things forward. Um, I appreciate that, and we've had some discussions in in our area, in Norwich, Stafford, where we have community nurses or by every whatever terminology, more effective terminology we want to call them. Um, and even on a, on a regional level, it would be helpful if we did crosswalks because there are people who are um, eminently willing and able to connect with each other if they just knew where each other were and what we can just do to serve each other. So um, statewide level, regional level, um, they're all useful. So thank you again. Thank you. Representative Holcomb. Hi, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for this really smart and courageous work. And in the legislature, we can't do our job without people like you doing this kind of work. So I wanted to start off by thanking you for that. And I wanted to go back and echo the comments of Margaret Gadden related to community care coordinators or healthcare extenders which in our area have been a low cost intervention that substantially reduced the need for institutional care. And one of the challenges we have is that because they are essentially operating outside the healthcare system, they're not pulling down uh, Medicaid or Medicare reimbursement, even when the same board could have been qualified for that um, because they're operating outside that system of care. And then the other question I had um, was we didn't talk at all about uh, school-based mental health or school-based health services. Um, and we are seeing a growing use of those kinds of services. And that also raises a question. Um, we've seen substantial increases in investment there. Sometimes they're accessing or fully accessing Medicaid to, to serve some of those, uh, provide some of those services, and sometimes they're not. And I wondered if you'll be looking at all at best practices in other states and making recommendations related to school-based mental health and school-based health services um, in the final report. Thank you for the question. Well, I'll turn to Dr. Hamry, because I know you've got thoughts on this. Yes, well, the short answer is yes. I mean, a very important service, important for, access and equity and a way to, uh, you know, keep people from needing a lot of health care service. So thank you for raising that. Didn't have time to talk about that tonight along with other things, but yes. All right. Um, any other questions or comments? We've got a couple minutes left. Oh, and I'll jump into the fray. Please. Um, good evening, everyone. Mike Fisher here, healthcare advocate. Um, I guess I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what a number of people have said about the importance of, I'll say, low tech answers to what's going on in our community, the community nurse effort, SASH. Um, hey, bringing care to where people are and helping coordinate their care is a no-brainer. <clears throat> we know where SASH funding is coming for, for next year. I don't think we know where it's coming from, coming the next year. Um, similarly, the state portion of Blueprint is a real question of where that money is coming from. And um, and the points that have been made by Representative Holcomb about the public supports for the community nurse effort, these are low-hanging fruit, in my opinion. And at the same time, I know that in previous meetings in this effort, there's been a lot of discussion about the other end of the spectrum, the high-tech efforts, the electronic medical records, the, the, you know, the, the many, many efforts that have been made that are more on the IT side, that uh, it was one of the strongest comments from the provider community that um, that 
that effort has caused a, created a, a tremendous drag on energy and on time, and in many people's opinion, has not led to better outcomes. Now, I know we're not getting rid of com computers in the examination room. <clears throat> I know that. But I just wanted to reflect that we are shoveling money into healthcare IT systems as fast as we possibly can. I, I, I shudder to think how much in an annual basis goes from Vermonters into healthcare IT. It would be an interesting project to try and capture that completely. Um, and so I, I guess I just want to recognize the number of legislators are in the room that, you know, you know, budgeting is, uh, you know, the, our budgets are a statement of our values. And um, there are a number of efforts in front of us that I think we all know in our, you know, the gut and of our stomachs that that are the right things to do, even before we get a report from Mr. Hamry. Um, and we need to figure out how to how to have long term solutions to those funding. And, and somebody else said it already. I'll say it again. SASH is a, um, a shadow of what it could be. We could multiply by 10 the amount of money that goes towards SASH, and we would really just be starting to serve our communities. Um, so thank you, Mr. Hamry and board members. It's 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 true. I mean, one of the things to, that Dr. Hamry's mentioned is how are we allocating this money, right? Because there really aren't paths here in this state at this time to more money, and it's an allocation decision to optimize it. And if you look at how we are spending our money, there are some outliers and some places where we might be able to do better. I mentioned primary care earlier, and we have for years put primary care as a driving trying to do with healthcare reform. But I don't know that we've gotten there. I don't know that we've actually put the money there. I don't know that we've done it with mental health or long-term care um, or with our nurses, frankly. So I think we can look at this opportunity to right size where we're putting the money to use it more effectively. Um, I'll, I can't help but mention electronic medical records. I was dumbfounded how often that came up. My last eight years of my career was spent investigating and prosecuting for the Department of Justice electronic medical record companies. And Vermont prosecuted more electronic medical record companies. Actually, nearly every single one that was prosecuted was from Vermont. And for very, very serious fraud allegations, failure to be interoperable, and failure to comply with a number of the requirements. So it's really incredible to hear that these problems are so impactful on providers and, and their inability to do their job because of the tech. Um, so I think that the Office of National Coordinator and DOJ should continue to focus on that work. Um, Dr. Hamry, it looked like you may have had something to say to Mr. Fisher. No, I, I agree with him. I mean, I, I think part of the role is to figure out what is the most effective and least expensive, least costly way to get this stuff done. And the SASH program is a good example. We just need a lot more of it, right? I mean, and, and to to identify in a in a sense in a prospective way the people that can benefit from that and get them into it. Um, and I think you know, for many of the things which have been raised, they're very good programs, but they are in, you know sort of spottily across the state. And in twos and threes, and so you know, I think one of the efforts that uh, you know Brendan and team will be doing is to to really look at that and figure out which ones to expand first, right? I mean, that's that that's after all the goal of this whole thing. And I think one of the important lessons of this process is these conversations that we're having, because in a way, this is the crosswalk. Right. And I think one of the things we've learned around the state is there are many, many very good things that people are trying and some work, some haven't worked, and we can learn from all that. And similarly with the ACO, I mean, our regulatory process there, the board made decisions to up the investment in primary care. We didn't think it was sufficient given the problems that we have in the the vulnerabilities there. So I think that is important to keep making sure we're allocating appropriately. Um, last comment, uh, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I know this is the last meeting of this kind, and I wanted to thank 
Chair Foster and all the members of the board and also your executive director, Susan Barrett, and Dr. Hamry and his entire team for this effort. Um, I um, serve on the Health and Welfare Committee in the Senate and was one of the um, legislators who worked really hard on Act 167, which created this process. And um, as uh, as Mike Fisher knows very well, I. I repeatedly, repeatedly said we need to have a public process and a public engagement process, and this has been part of it, um, so that we can hear directly from people who are working in the field and, most importantly, hear from directly from patients who are impacted every day by our healthcare system and the, the failures and successes of our healthcare system. Um, um, so I am really excited to get the final report from Dr. Hamry and his team um, in the next month, which I, I am looking forward to all the solutions that are provided or recommendations that are provided. And I just want to assure everybody on the call and um, who might be listening later that this is one of the priorities for next legislative session, along with uh, our education system and uh, property taxes um, and flood relief. Those are my top three um, for next session. So we will be working with the, uh, the Agency of Human Services and making sure that are following up on this, um, working with the Green Mountain Care Board, working with um, Mike Fisher as our healthcare advocate and many, many other people who've been involved in this process to move this forward. Um, so just thank you for all of your work and can't wait to read the final report. Thank you, Senator Hardy, and, and thanks for everyone in the legislature for marshalling this bill through because I do think it's the most important work we're doing in the state in healthcare right now, and I think it's just critical. So um, it's eight o'clock and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamry and AHS and to the legislators and to everyone who attended and spoke up tonight and participated. It's incredibly important to have the participation to make sure that we have a good um, product in the end that's well informed. So thank you everyone. And we can continue to receive public comment via letters and just emails to, to the board, which can be marked public or confidential and the board and Dr. Hamry and AHS read every single one. Um, so please continue to send them. And thank you for your time and have a good evening.